That's Ricky Skyra. You know, Quicksilver. That's where Ricky grew up. And that's the beautiful place, like right on the heart of Venice. Come on, you guys. It's Ricky right there. Right? That's his routine. This guy is a family guy. He's here on the barbecue. Rocking his shirt, born and raised. his family yeah. can you introduce yourself to our audience please i'm rick massey from venice beach california so guys rick massey basically is a legend from venice beach wild card many times like in the u.s open one of the best surfers the united states ever seen okay I moved here very young, and then I started to see him surfing, and that blew my mind. I didn't know him. And then next thing you see, he became my friend. And uh, we have all these stories to talk about it, but basically, how did you start to surf? Can you tell me that story, please? Uh, surfing? I don't know. It was just going down to the beach. All my sisters and all of them, like, everybody went to the beach. Summertime, everybody was at the beach, hanging out at the breakwater. Swimming, boogie boarding, surfing, but I started boogie boarding. That was the first thing I started. It was just simple to be on a boogie board and catch waves. And then all my friends, I started getting really good. And all my friends are like, dude, if you can get barreled on a boogie board, is that fun? I'm like, yeah. They're like, dude, how do you think it'd be standing up? It made more sense. It's a lot more fun standing up. Everybody got me on a surfboard and I started surfing. And the guy took over from there, Guy Kazaki, put me on his team to let me rake his yard and give me boards for free. So like, getting free boards from Guy and, you know, helping him out around the house, it's been cool. So surfing came easy. Pretty, pretty handy to me, I'd say. That's so sick, Rick. And uh, how did you start to compete? Like, uh, how did you get so good at it? And then like you went through the process to start to compete? Well, it's, that's kind of a funny story. Like this good friend of ours, this guy, Scott Adams, uh, they said they lived right there on 18th Street. Me and Bagel used to hang out with them all the time. And like, he took me and Bagel onto the wing. Like he'd take us night surfing, take us surfing here and there at all these different spots. And there was a contest at Topanga. And he's like, let's just go, I'm gonna take you, enter it. I think I was like, right at him, oh, then honey, they were like 13, 12 or 13. So I think boys was 13. And I went in and I, I won it, but it was dark. So they ran two heats together. And because I dropped in on a guy that fell in the barrel and they said like he could have made it. So they kind of like stopped the contest and ran the heat the next day. And then I already had first and they tallied it up and they're like, well, it wasn't fair to that guy because he didn't get first because they thought he would have won with that barrel. So they kind of retracted the whole thing and said, we're going to run two both heats next the next day and separate instead of together to see who really wants that and getting third. But then. Just, I caught a bug because kids were making fun of me because I was so small and I had a squeaky voice that they were making fun of me and I was just like, you know, now I want to beat you. You think I'm like, because one kid did say that. He goes, oh, I thought you were a girl. He had a squeaky voice. And I was like, what? He got me so mad at being a kid. I was like, no, now I'm going to beat you. So I kind of made it like, I wanted to start beating people after that. So they made fun of me. our interviews like bagel talk about you a lot you know like here uh, how uh, how did you meet bagel how was i met bagel i seen bagel around when i started hanging out at breakwater but like just didn't really know him and then when i went to mark twain i was in the seventh grade and bagel was in the ninth and i got to meet him this other guy craig i'm pretty sure his name was El bagel's like buddy and from there me and bagel were like fucking buddies like we surfed all the time so pretty much every day would see each other in the morning before school and it was, after that it was just like everybody was just we were always together after that like me and bagel just break water all of us it was cool like we just, us being the younger ones and then 
the smaller guys, bagel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like they, they just, like we started pushing each other, like who's gonna be better? And then we had Sach in the mix. Sach was actually really good when I first started. So Sach really got me going to like, want to be better than him, you know? And Sach, like Sach still kills it. Bagel still kills it. It's, you know, it's still fun to see them surf and bullshit with them. And like, after all the years, like my lady trips on that, like after all these years, we still hang out, we still kick it. We still, you know, we're still family. That's how beautiful is this place like here. I like to say that we are Venice, we are family. And uh, uh, yeah, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. We, we, keep, we keep it tight knit. It's unbelievable how when I got here, like you guys got my back. But I want to go through this story a little bit more like here about you competing. How did you meet? Because uh, Bego talks about the story about you and Strider, you know, Strider Ozuluski, you know, like he talks about like the kid from Venice Beach, Mexico against the Santa Monica kid. Well, it Why? basically was that. That's basically what it was. It was like Strider was a white kid from Santa Monica, it was a Mexican kid from Venice. And that was like a rival, just because of that. You know, we're the exact same age, we're two weeks apart. And me and Strider, like, Strider was always good. Like, Strider was fucking top notch. And like, Strider was already number one men of everything when I started. And then when I got into it, then I started beating him. And then he was more NSSA, and I, was, I just stayed WSA because I didn't get good grades. But, you know, it was, was kind of like, I still loved WSA and it was just so cool to like compete against Strider. And there was like guys like Shane Beshin, CC Beshalov, like a bunch of good guys, like Machado, all those guys. That's how I met all those guys surfing. Like we were, West Coast was tight with WSA and Strider was like my rival. Like that was like the guy right down the street like that I had to like compete against. And he was always the best in my division and we we're two weeks apart. So that's who I had like butt head with. Constantly. Bagel is two years above, so Bagels and Juniors and me and Strider were boys for the first two years or three years. So I think it was 15 or 16 when it goes to Juniors, and I was in boys from 13 or 15 or 16, whatever it was. And so I had to compete against Strider the whole time. And Strider kind of got the best of me in the early, early years, but I, I got him a couple of times. But then when it came to Juniors, Strider had nothing on me, you know, done. She wiped it up with Strider, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know Strider. Yo, Rick, you're welcome. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Ricky's house, but old cars, bicycles, stuff all over the yard, bathtub, surfboards everywhere, like living and dying over there. Where do you think you got it? Huh? Where do you think you got that style from? That's right, from the Waz. Yeah, Strider became a, you know, like, a, you know, works for WSL, like, it's crazy. But what about, like, here, uh, let's go a little farther into the story. I know you became, like, an NSSC uh, champion. Strider did that too, you know. Like well, Strider was an NSSA champion. I was a WSA champion. You WSA champion, okay. So. Our last year, the last year that we were in our juniors, I won, like, every contest all the way to the last contest. And then Strider got first and last one, I got second. But I had beat everybody. I was so far ahead of points, I didn't even surf the final contest and I already still won it because I already had too many points. I already smoked everybody the whole year. So the following year when I turned 18, that's when I turned pro, I was like, I'm tired of surfing for trophies. I want some money. Pay me that shit. You became a professional yeah, surfer. Yeah, at 18. I turned pro at 18. 18 I was like, 18, super young. Yeah, well, I, I went to Florida for some contests and I entered the PSA over there and I was beating all those guys, making it to the main event, winning every heat. And I was just like, why, why do I keep surfing for a trophy? I want to make some money. You know, so that's an unsure pro, 18. I did one men's event in the WSA as a, as a man. I was 18, and I won it. And I was like, see, it's too easy. These guys did nothing to me. They, didn't, they couldn't handle this. You were that good. Like, <laughs> I was just beating everybody. I thought it was funny. Because honestly, like, I knew a lot of guys could beat me. They were better than me, but I, I'd never looked at it like that. I always had the confidence in my head. I'm going to beat you. You gotta beat me, that's what they gotta do. I'm doing what I'm doing, you gotta beat me. Ricky, 
It's like one of the most beautiful styles you can ever see. His backside is amazing, you know, like here. And uh, he could be beating people nowadays on the tour, but the fact that he doesn't want to do that anymore, he has his different life, like here, you know, like he's part of this community, like Venice, you know, California. And uh, for me, like it was a big pleasure, like here and an honor to get, be to get to become his friend, okay? Because this guy was a wild card and uh, with 10 point rides at the US Open, you know? Back then was the SP. So I would you like to hear about this story? How did you get like a wild card for your first contest like of the SP? Like, I, I, got, I, went, I went so far in the juniors and then they let me surf it and then I figured how it went. And then I did really good. And that one, and I think it was the juniors because I got third in the juniors or something. Yeah, I got third. Ramachado won that one. And I got third in that one. I forget who was in the finals of Raw, but I got third in that one. And then I got to surf the main contest and I made it. I made the main event. And that's when I was doing good. I was whooping everybody. And I was just like, it was crazy. Like the whole, the junior, the OP junior, I won every heat all the way to the semis. Like five or six heats, won every heat, just smashing everybody. And then they went to the two man before it goes to the final. And that's what I lost on the man on man. Didn't know how to surf man on man. <laughs> so it's kind of confusing. I was like, I always just knew how to beat two other guys. It was, you know, so it's kind of confusing, but they let me get into the main event and all that. And so it was kind of cool, like the wild card or whatever they called it back then. But because I was in the juniors, but it was pretty cool. Like I did, I did pretty good. Then when I surfed, I think it was yourself, when I made the quarters in that one year, and that's when I got the 10 on the short pound. Oh my God, that was kind of funny. Tell me about that ride. Dude, I was in last. I don't even know what I needed. And this short pound, it was like, it was breaking on the shore, just doubling up. It was like super high tide and it was missing outside sandbar. It was just coming to the shore. I turned around on one, it was, looked like it was gonna close out. And I just pulled in and I, was, I purled basically on the takeoff and I pulled my nose out and I was in the barrel and I'm like, oh, no, I thought I was, it was gonna close out. So it's basically body surf it. But I saw a little opening and I, Doggy doored it, just came right out, and the whitewash was coming at me, and I just banked off it, and I was like, whoa, whoa, and then I made it, and they're like, I had three tens and two nine fives, and so I got a nine eight seven. I'm like, damn, I got three tens. You couldn't give me a ten across the board, so I got three tens and two nine fives. So I got a nine eight seven and one eight. Wow. Yeah, it was the heat before the quarters, and then I made the quarters on that one. And then the next heat, it was funny because Derek Hole got kind of a similar barrel. And same thing, he came flying out. And then after his heat, he got like a seven or eight, because mine was like, they didn't think I was going to make it. And he came up to me on the beach. He's like, dude, yours was good. He's like, that was way better than what I got. And I was like, yeah, I got the score. Because I was piling back out, and I was like, damn, I'm in fourth. Like, am I going to get to second? And they were like, Rick jumps into first. I was like, whoa. So I was, I was super stoked on that. I couldn't believe it. on a short break, little barrel. But it was so I was just looking out going, oh, I'm going to get work, get work. And I came out and just, Banked it and made it. I was, I was pretty stoked. After that, did you keep keep com kept to competing like on the SP? Yeah, no, no. I did the QS for a long time. I kept on the QS for years, and then it was just you know it became like a struggle. Like a lot of family shit happened, and kind of like got to me, and just wanted to be close to family. Mm -hmm. So kind of like I, I went through a rough spot in my life, and kind of like. I was going on tour and it was like rainy, shitty waves, you know, it wasn't good. And it just became like, you know, you don't, when you're not in a good spot and you're bad places and it's like Seattle, Washington, so it's just rainy and depressing or you freaking want to go kill yourself. Like I just called my sponsors and my manager and I'm like, fly me home. I don't even want to be here. Like I was in Europe for two months and I couldn't handle it. I was like, I was there like a month and I flew home. It just got too gnarly for me. You have a really good relationship with your sponsor, like, which is Quicksilver, guys. And uh, how did this relationship started? Like, when did you start to ride for Quicksilver? Well, Randy took me when I was 13 or 14, Randy Wright. Randy was already on Quicksilver, Jay Adams was on Quicksilver, and Randy took me and Solo Scott. And we met up with uh, the manager, Danny Kwok. And Danny Kwok looked at the videos of me and Solo, and they're like, this kid's 13, that guy's like 19. Or 20 whatever solo it was and they go nah we'll, we'll we'll sponsor him and right there danny kwok had the first quick dry shorts 
And Danny was so tiny. Danny clocks along like 5'2". And he was about the same size as me when I was a kid. And he gave me the prototype pair of shorts that they had that they never even came out with. And I got them, Danny Clark gave them to me. And I was like, oh, shit, that was cool. In his office, he gave me a brand new pair of quick dries that quick first came out with. It was dope. And it's still your sponsor nowadays. Yeah, they still take care of me. It's just, it's hard with all this corporate shit that's going on with. They're selling the company, and you got to deal with new managers. But every guy that's taken over is always taking care of me. Like I did the full collab with Pacifico and Quicksilver. They they took care of me. They styled me out. Like, they, they every manager that's come on has known who I am, and they've always just take care of me. So it's, it's actually been really cool. Yeah, shout out it's to been a good ride. Yeah. yeah. Because it was taking care of me for 20 years. Basically, guys, I just want to tell you guys about his family, okay? The Massive family is being here in Venice for you know, like decades, you know, like here, I mean, like here, I don't even know how long, but they are one of the number one families in Venice, okay? Tell me about this beautiful family, please. I don't want to say beautiful. I mean, you don't want to see the pictures of my sister or brother or any of them. But, you know, I, my parents came here way back in the day, like I'd say they were in the late 60s, and family all came here, and I mean, growing up here and meeting everybody, and back then it was cool because once you started meeting everybody, you got to know the parents, and the parents looked after the kids and looked after your kids, and we looked after their kids, and then it, Venice was so tight-knit, even more so way back then, you know? So that's why, like, a, a lot of us are still that tight-knit, because our families are like that. The parents are like that, and we've always been like that, you know? So it's like, all our families got to know each other, and grew up with each other, like my dad knew that dad and that mom and them and them, and they'd come over and hang out. And it was kind of cool like that. So it's, it's, it's pretty much, that's how our family became like, you know, established here because there was so many of us first off. And then we knew everybody and everybody loved my mom. My mom was like the greatest lady in the world. And my dad was a biker that used to race dragsters. So all the kids from the neighborhood come over here and see my dad's dragster. My dad would light it up and drive it down the street and people, oh my God, my dad revved that thing and then he'd have his Harley and it, it was just like, my family started getting more and more respect throughout the years and, you know, it just became like that and like still to this day, my mom's like so beyond love in the neighborhood, like everybody loves my mom, like you see the born and raised mural, my mom's on there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, I can't say much more than that, like. They put my mom on there. I'm like, my mom was stoked to see that. I was pretty bitching. Did you have a good relationship with Chris? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris, I used to take Chris surfing when I was a kid. He would surf all the time. That's why, like, when he started doing his thing, it was kind of cool to watch him break off and do his own thing, because I used to have to take him to the beach with me. I'd have to, like, you know, watch after him. And he lived up the street, so it was like, he was over here with Patrick, a little cousin next door, and they, we all hung out together. Even those kids, like, because I was always the youngest when I was growing up, so having these kids around, I took them under my wing, and I was like, let's go surf, come on, let's go jump in the water. It was like Mike Baldwin, Patrick, Chris, all those kids. And it, was, it was fun hanging out with them surfing. Even like Christian, you got to deal with this knucklehead nowadays, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's just like uh, mind-blowing, like all these stories that we have, like in Venice, and uh, all these families that are here. And uh, to see Chris take born and raised to the next level, you know? Yeah. And then, like, he, when the brain is doing so well, we lost him. Rest in peace, Chris. We, like, really love you here. Like, we're never going to forget you, you know? And uh, also, Jay Adams, you know? Like, uh, it's a guy, like, that I know he was your friend. Like, uh, we lost him. We really miss Jay, you know? And uh, he made, left all this legacy. And uh, I just want to ask you a little bit, do you have any stories with Jay that you want to share with us? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the first time I ever met Jay, we knew there was a house by the beach that uh, had grip tape and stuff in there. And we kind of broke into the, it was an abandoned house or whatever, like they, he was already moved out or whatever, there's stuff in there. So we went in there and started 
finding grip tape and stickers and stuff. And Jay came in. He was like, what? What are you guys doing in here? He was like, oh, take that, take that. Here, let me give you more stuff. And that's when I first met Jay. And it was kind of cool. And then after that, like hanging out, breakwater, skating, all that, me and Jay got to grow up and hang out with each other while well, he was grown. But I got to hang out with them. I remember he made me drive his car, his station wagon in Paula when I was 15. And we pull up at the house and my mom's like, he ain't got a license. And he's like, oh, Miss Massey, if he gets a ticket, I'll pay for it. I got warrants, so I want him to drive. And my mom's like, okay, well, you better pay for his ticket. So my mom let me keep driving the car. And it was funny because, I mean, I was with Jay in Florida. Like, I was over there for a contest and met up with them. And he wanted me to drive back all the way across the United States with them. I was like, no, I can't do four or five days with you straight. Oh, and then when I used to go to Hawaii, I always stayed with Jay. I always stayed with Jay when I was in Hawaii. And we had good times. Five in the morning, that guy waking you up. Let's go look at pipe. Let's go look at such a, come on, let's go. And like, still asleep and the guy's waking you up. And Oh, and with coffee, you like, know? Yeah, yeah, dragging you out. Like, come on, let's go, let's go. You got to get up. I'm like, fuck, all right, come on, man. Let me wake up. Let me go brush my teeth. And he's already in the car. Like, he was that surf driven, man. It was insane to just see him on it every freaking morning. Like, he was just badass. Like, I, I cannot give him enough credit how on the waves he was. It was so sick to see him like that. And every morning, Piper Sunset, Piper Sunset. Like, and we lived right at sunset, but he wouldn't walk the back door and look at it. He'd get in, the, get in the car and go drive up and look at it and then drive over to Piper and look at it and see what was the best, you know, and then we'd go surf. And uh, tell me this relationship, because you have uh, this amazing relationship with Hawaiians. You know, when I went to Kauai the first time, you introduced me people. When I got there, people took care of me. Like, tell me about like this relationship that you have with Hawaii. Well, I've been going there since I was a kid, so it's like, I think more or less they took me in because I wasn't white. When you're dark skinned, they're cool with you. So like, when I started going there young, I stayed with Hawaiian families and they were always cool with me. And I got to know all the boys, like we hung out with everybody on the North Shore, especially when I stayed with Nick and Jay, like you meet all the hardcore locals. And so I got to meet everybody, hang out with everybody. And everybody like takes you in, like, I don't know why me so much, but like I said, I think it's more because I was Mexican, like dark skin, and I wasn't like all the other kids trying to go over there and prove themselves. I was just over there being me, not trying to like, oh, I gotta catch the biggest wave, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. I wasn't doing all that. I just went over there and surfed and hung out with those guys and like, you know, we did our thing together. It made it more fun than like every guy trying to be out there when that photographer's there, you know, gotta be over there, I gotta get that picture. I never did that. I never chased the camera or, you know, chased the lens, you know, I just, I just went and surfed and hung out with the guys and did our thing. So I think people respected me more for being that, you know? Definitely, that's one of the things that I saw when you were the first, when I met you, I was like, man, this guy doesn't brag about like who he is and he is who he is, you know, of the best surfer this planet's ever seen, you know? And that's the thing that I really like you, you know? Like, and I like you that the first, like when I met you, because you always like, you're so welcome to me, like even though I'm from Brazil, you know? And, uh, I think that's why the Hawaiians, they, they like you too. You know? What do you do nowadays, you know? Well, see, that's, that's the one thing that I love what I do. It's like working on surfboards. I've met so many different people, so many cool people that like, you know, back in the day, all our friends would be like, they're a kook. Oh, they're, they're because they don't hang out with us, they're kooks, you know? It's like, I'm sure you've been there with your boys and like they see a pretty girl walking by with some guy that is probably different, from a different country. I don't dress like this. And they're like, oh, why is she with him? what you think you're better than them like they always like put people down because like we're from here and we're supposed to be cool but meeting all different people from around the world and looking at different boards and getting to see everything different like it opened your eyes to like you know you don't you don't stay like this with blinders like i look at everybody that person's cool that person's cool that person's cool i don't care if you're gay straight trans i don't give a fuck. you know you're, you're you you be you and be happy with your life and i'm cool with you Hi guys, hello. Family picture, you know. Mike Chappelle, our friend. What's up, brother? Rick's friend, you know. These are hot. These are good. Oh, a good message, or just even good advice, is you know, just always be open to everything. Never be closed-minded. Never think you're better than anybody. You know, there's always gonna be somebody better than you. There's always gonna be somebody smarter than you. Just never be closed-minded. Never judge. Just always be open-minded and, you know, just be yourself. And listen to your parents, because <laughs> they know more. 
Nah, that's honest to God truth. We're the groundbreakers. We're the movers and the shakers. 